So I'm not going to talk about digital threats at all, actually. Sorry. Um, I'm going to talk about what I think is the most important financial topic of the next 20 years. And that topic is credit availability. Credit is the sine qua non of being a part of modern society. We all use it every day. I used it to pay for my plane ticket to fly here from LA and to pay the, the buy my tube pass to get here, which was a debacle. But I'll go. So I am Douglas Merrill. I'm the CEO and founder of Zest Finance. And I'm not going to talk about business either. What I am going to talk about is history. This uh, steampunk photograph, steampunk, come on, you guys know steampunk? You're gonna, it's the end of the day, liven up, it'll be a lot more fun. Okay, so this steampunk photograph is a photograph from the 1940s of what at the time was a pretty strong computer. Uh, now, of course, it looks like a joke, uh, particularly given that the operators are wearing really, really bad ties. <coughs> a couple years later, things have begun to change. Uh, in the 1940s, obviously, particularly in Great Britain, there was a massive increase in the power and understanding of, of, of computers and computational devices. In the 1950s towards the 1960s, they began getting businessified, if you will. Computers began being applied to kind of business problems as opposed to purely uh, military problems. And right here is 1959. 1959, Bill Fair and Earl Isaac got together to form Fair Isaac, because they have really good branding. Fair Isaac existed to provide bespoke underwriting solutions to companies that needed to provide credit. They were capitalizing on a very recent piece of math called logistic regression, which turns out to be a really nice tool for doing really simple underwriting. Through the 1960s, technology continues to improve and gets more and more ingrained in business. By the 1970s, companies are issuing their checks uh, electronically with printers. They're offering credit cards. ATMs begin to exist. In the 1980s, computers reached their highest, most valuable point, uh, making music with Flock of Seagulls. <laughs> Waiting for the laugh, going on. At the, at the end of the 1980s, 1989, Fair and Isaac come back by having created the FICO score, probably the single most important credit transformation of the last many, many, many years. And the FICO score depends on the growth. It still sticks with this single piece of math, the uh, logistic regression. But it builds upon the fact that computation is now virtually ubiquitous. And the fact that there are really, really good credit files about all of us. Credit bureaus have arisen. There's a good standardized data about how our credit activities are, how our payment activities have been, just in general, about us as people. And technology didn't stop changing in 1989. In 1990, if you bought one megabyte of hard drive storage, it would cost you roughly $1,500 US. Today, you can't buy a megabyte of storage, right? It's too small. But if you could, it would cost you roughly a thousandth of a cent. It's almost a five million fold decrease in cost. The last 30 years have been dominated by Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law and has impacted everything. Everything. Except underwriting. Underwriting today is virtually the same as it was in 1989. It still you know, relies on pretty weak math. It still relies very heavily on the FICO score. And it still relies very, very heavily on credit bureau files. Credit bureau files work great for the 80% of the world, the first world, I should say, that has easy access to credit. It turns out, though, that 20% of people in the first world, these numbers are pretty close to right in the UK. They're slightly under in the US. 20%, one in five people have either what's called a thin credit file, which is to say they don't have much credit data, or they have a file that has material errors in it. So either they're missing data or the file's just wrong. In either of those two events, this really, really simple underwriting, this trivial piece of math, this very small number of variables, et cetera, yields that person not having access to credit. Why are we still acting as if it's 1990? We can do better. I got into this business for a very personal reason. My sister-in-law, uh, who is a full-time student, single mother of three, and holds down a full-time job, called me one day needing to borrow some money to buy tires. I was relatively unsympathetic. I said something like, well, not my problem. Um, maybe not my finest hour. Anyway, she said, no, no, Douglas, I need the money. And I finally thought it through, and I realized, oh, right, you can't put this $300 set of tires on a credit card because you don't have one. If you don't get your car fixed, you can't get to work. If you can't get to work, you lose your job. In the US, if you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. One little, tiny, pretty trivial event can push you all the way off the grid. 
And it's entirely because we haven't realized yet that underwriting should be done in a different way. I had to have big data up here because it had to be buzzword compliant. Um, I don't like this label at all because big data is not about bigness at all. And it's only kind of barely about datedness. So it's a label which is fundamentally wrong. So I'm going to spend a little while now criticizing a term that arose largely out of Google when I was still there. So I'm going to slap myself around, I guess. <laughs> so when you hear people talk about big data, they always think, oh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a whole bunch of bits, like a lot of them, like maybe this many. And I'm going to drop them into a stats program. I, w I just spent a bunch of money on SAS. Or hey, look, I acquired a PhD, and, and she installed R. And I'm going to use this big stats box. And I'm going to get all the answers. Right? Right? Well done. Wrong. Uh, it turns out that every answer you get when you drop it into the box is virtually incorrect. It's virtually guaranteed to be incorrect. And I'm going to give you some examples of why. But now I'm going to take a shot at the second buzzword. Everyone knows that the hottest job currently is data scientist. That label is terrible because data scientists are it's just wrong. right? Data is not about science because science is inherently about data. And what you do with the data and to get it right in big data is not just science. It's also art. So I want to make the hottest job in the world be data artists. Data artists are people, they may be mathematicians, they may be computer scientists, they might be psychologists. What they are is people who understand the quirks of data and understand exactly how data is represented and think through and enjoy thinking about the nature of what you're talking about. Black box models with no understanding of the data are guaranteed to be wrong. Now, I'm not saying forget the math. There's lots of good uses for math. Our, our principal scientist is a PhD in some theoretical form of math mathematics that I don't understand. Um, so he talks and I nod. But to get this right, to actually understand how to compute lots and lots of data, you have to actually understand how the math works. You can't just ignore it. But you can't understand only the math. You also have to understand the importance of the data and the nature of the data. About half of my company are X Capital One people, who are people who have spent 10, 15, 20 years doing really, really powerful underwriting. They didn't understand the math, but the math folks didn't understand the underwriting. Getting the two together is how you win. Now, just for fun, let's show how you lose. How many of you know what the normal distribution is? So the rest of you are either asleep or lying. So anyone's ever had a math class that's in the normal distribution, right? It's that pretty bell curve. It's exact. Everyone knows how it works. It's got a mean, right? The mean's right in the middle. It's got a standard deviation, right? Because two standard deviations mean you're within 95%. So all observations fall within two standard deviations, right? Everyone knows this. The problem is it's always wrong. Nothing in the world is normally distributed. Height isn't normally distributed. Gender isn't normally distributed. Earthquakes aren't normally distributed. Hurricanes aren't normally distributed. Hurricane Sandy, anyone? <laughs> The problem is, in the real world, it turns out the two standard deviations doesn't cover anything like 95% of the observations. The tails are really thick. Why should you care? You should care because those really important statistics tests, like the p-values and those correlations and everything you've computed, all depend on having normal distribution. They're just wrong otherwise. And the more data you have, the more likely you're going to get a really, really solid p-value, which means you're going to be more convinced about the wrong answer. <laughs> and even if you happen to look into something which what I almost threw this into the audience right there. Um, it's possible. I've got several slides left. You guys might want to take cover. Um, it turns out that even if you got lucky and you got something that was normally distributed, it's still not going to work. Here's why it's not going to work. For the traditional stats test to work, Every single observation has to be independent. Right? Every little event has to be unrelated to every other event. They can't be related. Because if they're related, it turns out you don't have this beautiful probability distribution. And nothing in the world is independent. For example, everyone knew in 2007 that subprime housing units that were in different parts of the world were not related. They were independent. The problem is they weren't. 
right? They were all a partial product of a bond bubble. Because they weren't independent, all the stats tests were simply wrong. The distribution was wildly wrong, and the stats tests were hugely wrong. You actually have to understand what you're doing for big data to work. And it's not only the math that you have to understand. I love this slide. <laughs> I've never used it before, but it's going to make every talk I ever give for the rest of my life. So uh, about 10% of our customers, it's estimates, uh, show up on their credit bureaus as being dead. 10%, 1 in 10, dead. Uh, turns out they're not, in case there was any question. And the cool is we call them zombie borrowers, right? Because what else would you call them? Right? They're zombie borrowers. The cool thing is the zombie borrowers pay off better than the living borrowers. <laughs> you know why that's cool? Because when the zombie apocalypse happens, my business is going to keep growing. What about y'all? <laughs> it's a cheap speaker trick, by the way, to set the, the clicker down on the, on the lectern. Everybody hears it. That means they wake up and go, oh, hang on. It's going to be question session in a minute. <laughs> Before the 1950s, if you wanted to get credit, you went to a bank, you sat across this massive mahogany desk, or maybe Burlwood desk, from a, from a guy, it was always a guy, in a blue suit with a red tie. If I just made fun of anyone in the audience, I apologize. Blue suit, red tie. You said, look, I really want a loan. He looked at you and said, hey, you know, my kids go to, go to Sunday school with your kids. You're a good person. I'm going to give you a loan. It had, the, the credit decisioning process was a very holistic one. The problem is, if your kids didn't go to Sunday school with the bank person's kids, you didn't get a loan. So 1959, Farron Isaac, and then particularly 1989, changed the game. Credit availability explodes because they take it out of this really, really holistic, super personal, very handshake-oriented world into a world of math. And that math worked really well for a lot of us. So it's changed the game. Farron Isaac transformed modern credit. But the problem is, there's a set of people who have been left out. They were left out under the banker guy, and they're still left out under the fair and Isaac genre of credit. And it's not fair that they're left out. Right? These people are bad credit. They're not bad people. Right? Just because you have bad credit doesn't mean you shouldn't get a certain a loan which is fair, fairly priced, fairly structured. You ought to get credit because credit is the entry point to modern society. Clearly, big data and analysis of data is part of the story. Right? But doing it wrong is no better than not doing it at all. Making predictions, forming beliefs on things that are simply mathematically incorrect. Not making predictions or not making understanding around data that you should hunt down just leaves you off worse than you started. Don't bother wasting money hiring your data artists if you don't also spend time making sure that the data the art and the science are all correct. And with that, thank you very much. You changed sides. Surprise expectations. Uh, yes, um, I was like looking over there. Where did, where did so you go? Very entertaining. What people don't necessarily realize is I think you've raised $92 million of stage one and stage two round um, investment funding. And you've got pretty big ambitions with Zest, Zest Finance. So you started out as Zest Cash helping serve people who found it harder to get loans. Right, we were direct lenders, that's cash. And then you changed to offering data analytics to the lenders right. themselves. We're an, we're an underwriting technology company, so lenders come to us, we help them underwrite. So what was it that led you to change the model? I mean, so when I founded the company, my goal was to save the underbanked billions of dollars, like a why shoe low, right? You know. um, the problem is, with one lender, it's pretty hard to do that. Whereas if you can help tens, dozens, you know, many, many US and international lenders, you have a lot more leverage. So we figured let's, but on the other hand, if you're a lender, are you gonna buy my underwriting if I'm in some sense competing with you? Right, that's just kind of an insuperable conflict. So we shut down the lending arm and became uh, an underwriting company. It's been fun and we're growing fast. Um, is your big challenge to do with regulation or to do with incumbents not getting it? I mean, I think some, probably some of all of the above. Right? Regulation is always a challenge in, in almost all countries. But um, I think what's more of a challenge is if you're a lender, okay, underwriting and risk management has to be what you perceive as your core competence, right? 
So it's got to be a strange interaction to say, you know what, it's my core competence, but I'm going to go hire those Google Capital, Google Capital One folks to do it for me. And that's just a weird interaction. So I think, I think understanding, uh, and cu understanding and customer acquisition are probably the two hardest things we do. Data is obviously fun. What do you do with 92 million? Well, I drive a nice car. <laughs> no, but seriously, you, it, you know, once you've got the algorithms, the analytics, mm -hmm. and you're not actually lending, why do you need so much? Yeah, and I think that the thing is that, we, that one never has the algorithms. So we publish uh, a new algorithm, so a new entire from front to back algorithm every three months. Wow. Our current algorithm takes about 11,000 variables. It expands them into 70,000 elements. It runs 10 independent machine learning models against the entirety of the 70,000s. It ensembles those 10 together and then yields a continuous variable. It does all that in about three seconds. Um, so yeah. our next iteration, so that, that's a new iteration. So we, we, that, that is a new thing. We'll iterate that twice, once a month. And then in three months, we'll release the next version, which we think will roughly increase input variables by a factor of 10. Um, and that costs money. You know, it's human costs, it's data costs, it's computational costs. Well, Errol Damon only looks at 8,000 data points per you know, microsecond, so he's obviously got to work harder. They ran a spectacular company, so being compared to them is a compliment. Thank you, Douglas, for telling your story. Thanks much. So